Growing up playing hockey and then moving on to a sport like weightlifting has helped me to learn some things about shoulder resilience, whether it be things that I did or things that I miss out on. I've also worked through multiple shoulder injuries, many muscle strains, as well as separating both my AC joints. One of them I separated a few times and now I have a nice step deformity there. That thing's hanging on by a thread. I got some physio for it that was all right and better than most physio, but still not all that great. So what was done for was some ultrasound, some electrical stimulation, light banded external and internal rotation exercises, and then some light unstable bench press with some progressive overload. But there was no plan to transition it into actual training and go from there. I even had an orthopedic surgeon tell me that I would need surgery if I wanted to be able to reach overhead properly again, and as well as play sports in the years to come. This advice is just terribly inaccurate as well as wrong, and judging from what my patients tell me, advice like this is the norm. And this is a pretty big problem in the fitness and healthcare industries, but I digress. As a thankfully naive 19 year old, I thought that this was all really stupid and that I could just strengthen my way out of it. And 11 years later, my shoulder is stronger and more capable than ever. So I want to start by talking about typical shoulder rehab and where it goes wrong before I go into my approach on how to build big bulbous and resilient shoulders. Typical shoulder rehab usually has a large focus on the rotator cuff as well as restoring scapulohumeral rhythm, which is thought to be this perfect and magical two to one ratio of the shoulder blade and arm movement. Now the first problem with that is that the 2 to 1 ratio is a bunch of BS. Some dude in 1944 just decided that that looked like about the ratio it moved at and that restoring it to that perfect 2 to 1 ratio is all that really mattered. Now there's been a lot more studies since then and they've shown that the range of normal is way bigger than that and it can be 1 to 1 or 6 to 1 in a pain-free population. And there were even some outliers with a higher ratio in those studies that didn't have pain but not enough of them for them to include it in the data and kind of make that concrete statement. So trying to restore this normal is usually just a distraction since the movement is already usually in that normal range. And the healthcare and fitness industries love to demonize normal movement and make you afraid of it and then just prey on that fear to sell you a solution. Now, even if there was a perfect scapulohumeral rhythm, there is another problem. And that's that it's near impossible to actually see how the scapula and humerus are moving. Not to mention the more fat or muscle that's there, it makes it even harder to see the movement. So when people are just assessing this with their eyes, which is how it's done the grand majority of the time, they're really just flipping a coin and pulling a diagnosis out of thin air. And there was a study done on this where the physios were told that the person coming in had shoulder pain and they were more likely to diagnose this scapular dyskinesia, or in other words, shoulder don't move right. And what's funny about this study is that those patients didn't have shoulder pain and they were lying. So these physios were biased into thinking that the person had pain. They were more likely to see this improper movement and then try to get the person to be afraid of it and then sell them on the solution to it, which is their treatment. And another argument that could be made for seeing this is just comparing it side to side. Now, this is good in theory, but it kind of starts to fall apart when you consider that massive range of normal. So there could be huge differences side to side, but each shoulder could still be in that normal range. Also, differences side to side have been shown to be not problematic. Humans are just asymmetric and life is asymmetric. Most people have a dominant hand and they brush their teeth with one hand every single day. Most sports are designed in a way that is extremely asymmetric. And all your organs are different side to side. There is no problem with asymmetry and people need to stop trying to make it a problem. So all in all, not only is this movement seen to be not important, but it's also very difficult to observe and the range of normal is huge. So trying to work on it is largely a distraction. You're better off just focusing on working through a full range of motion, getting strong, and then paying attention to your own personal symptoms. And like I said at the start, there's also a heavy focus on the rotator cuff muscles in rehab. Now the problem is as usually done with these light bands or small five pound dumbbells like what was given to me in my rehab. Now training these movements can be helpful, don't get me wrong, but your prime movers are also going to have large impacts on these movements and possibly contribute more to them than the rotator cuff muscles themselves. So the bigger muscles might just be taking over and it might just be more important to train those in general rather than trying to focus on these small rotator cuff muscles. Now, if you have a problem with internal and external rotation, it can be good to focus on it, but for the most part, you don't need to just try to strengthen your rotator cuff muscles preemptively by doing those movements. And just trying to focus on these small muscles with these small movements may be a large waste of time if that's the majority of your training. So all of those videos that are come to a shoulder day with me that's focused on shoulder health and 80% of the workout time is them doing these small banded exercises and focusing on this proper alignment are just people that are distracted and wasting time. If people adopt this routine and it makes their shoulder feel better, that's because it's load management in disguise. So they're just not pushing their shoulder to the limits all the time, actually giving them time to calm down and heal. But the problem is, is that these exercises don't have progression into them. 
They stay at the same weight, they stay at the same intensity, and they never actually get heavier and actually drive any strength gain. This isn't shoulder health, this is just staying in a detrained state. But we're not here for that. We're not here to live in a bubble. We're here to achieve greatness and we want to push ourselves while feeling good doing it. And again, to clarify, I'm not saying that these movements are useless, I'm just saying that they're largely a waste of time if you never progress them. They can have their place, but you need to use them sparingly and you also need to not underload them. You can use progressive overload with these. You can get them heavier and work them harder, but always using those light bands or five pound dumbbells isn't gonna help you build resilient shoulders. And the rotator cuff's main job is to centrate the joint, or basically it's pulling your arm bone against your shoulder blade as best as possible as you go through a range of motion. This is kind of keeping that optimal positioning. But with that being said, that optimal positioning isn't needed. The way I like to think about it is that it's helpful but it's not necessary. Your body has a lot of redundancy built into it and a lot of muscles do similar movements or the same movements. So even if you have some damaged rotator cuff muscles or a missing rotator cuff muscle because it's torn, your body can still produce the same movements. It just takes some time to kind of re-coordinate it and then get strong in it again. Okay, so now it's time for my approach to how to build resilient shoulders. I'm just gonna kind of rip through some of these when they're pretty straightforward and then dive deeper when it's needed. Starting off, just like what I got you to do with the back in my previous video, you wanna train your shoulder through a full range of motion. And there's gonna be a big focus on vertical pushing and pulling. So a bench press, a row, an overhead press, pull up of your choice. I don't really need to go through those more except for the rows. With those, it can be helpful to do some with a low elbow and then some with a high elbow. You don't need to find some perfect ratio between the two, you just need to include at least a little bit of both in your program. So for example, I do most of my rowing with a low elbow because that is more in line with my goals right now. And then I do a couple hard sets with a high elbow just to kind of round it out. So you can do most of the rowing in your preferred way and then just add in a couple sets of the other way. And it's also helpful to do some of these movements with a faster variation. So you can do some plyo push-ups, or my favorite is to do ego reps on bench press and rows, drop pull-ups, anything like that. Using momentum really helps to produce a very potent stimulus, and it can lead to a lot of strength gain, muscle gain, and resilience. This will help you build robust shoulders capable of pulling you up from the pits of despair, as well as pushing you up in the morning as the crushing weight of life is pushing you down. You will persevere, you are strong. And doing things like the Olympic lifts is a great way to work in these faster movements as well, and they have a catching component which can be really helpful. You don't need to be all that good at them to get the benefits from them, and you can even just split them up into the pulls and the jerks separately, so you don't even need to do the full movement. And as a bonus, adding in some power shrugs can be pretty helpful from time to time as well. They're not really necessary because they're similar to the Olympic movements. It can be really nice to get that heavier stimulus with the heavier weight from time to time, so I don't want you to feel like they're useless. If you like doing them, go ahead and do them. And of course, we want to build up some thick and juicy delts because after all, we're trying to build big, ballless, and resilient shoulders. They are already getting a good amount of work from the pushing and pulling, but it can be really helpful to add in some direct work to them. And a great way to do that is with lateral raises. You can do either dumbbell or cable lateral raises. Personally, I prefer cable lateral raises and I focus a little bit more on the bottom portion of them, but I still do dumbbell lateral raises from time to time. And as a side note, cable lateral raises can be a really great tool for rehab, and I actually use it with my patients all the time. That's because you can really emphasize the bottom portion of the movement and still load these heavy. If you're having problems with your shoulder around parallel or overhead, and that's limiting your lateral raise, then load up the cable lateral raise really heavy and just focus on that bottom 60 degrees. You can build up a lot of strength here and then slowly add in a little bit more range with lighter weights as that becomes more tolerable and eventually you'll be able to go back to normal movement. And the way that people typically do cable lateral raises is actually extremely stupid. So most people just lean away from the machine, but that gives them the same kind of resistance profile as a dumbbell raise. Like I just said, you're gonna wanna emphasize the bottom portion of the movement with these. Set it up so that you're standing straight up and the cable is about in line with your hand at the very bottom. That way you get the most tension at the very bottom of it. And just like with any other movement, do these with a variety of loading schemes. So you can do some higher reps or some lower reps. I like to work in the four to eight rep range most of the time. And as you can probably guess by now, also do some ego reps. I absolutely love doing ego reps with these and I find them amazing, but I use some body and momentum at the beginning to get the weight up and then let it fall for the first half of the eccentric and I'm trying to stop it really hard during that second half of the eccentric, turn it around quick 
and then throw it up as hard as I can. The stimulus from this is extremely potent and it's amazing. My delts are always fired up after doing these, so I really suggest trying them out. Another great delt builder can be upright rows, and all the same things about loading apply to these, just like I said with lateral raises. Basically, you're just trying to get strong on any exercise you do while working within your capacity. If you need to take some time off or take some weight off, then do that. And sticking to strength work, it's also good to get some heavy carrying in. Now, if you have a good, well-rounded strike program, you're already going to have this covered with your deadlifts, or like I mentioned earlier, those heavy power shrugs. A more specific movement for this could be some heavy farmer carries, and that can be helpful from time to time, but it's not really all that necessary. It's a little bit more focused on kind of prepping for a strongman competition, but it can be really fun to carry some extra heavy weight from time to time. So if you like it, throw it in. And all of what I said is enough to build up some decently resilient shoulders already, and that's where the majority of your focus should be and the majority of your training time should be. But now it's time for a little bit of that extra secret sauce to get that last bit of resilience or just help your shoulder through some sticking points that you might be having. And what a lot of people leave out is doing some extreme ranges of motion and awkward movements. When these are left out, people get really good at dealing with things right in front of them or just a bit above them, but they don't really get that strength at those end ranges or those awkward positions. And that's usually when their shoulders start to end up getting a little bit aggravated. And this is also why myths like don't do bench press because it's going to ruin your overhead mobility kind of take place. And this myth is really prevalent in the Olympic weightlifting world. And I think that's a problem, not because of the bench press, it's because the people that do the bench press a lot and have a strong bench press usually only focus on the bench. So they're not working in these other ranges of motion. They're not working in their overhead range. They're not working their chest to a full range of motion. They're not getting into these awkward ranges of motion. So that's why their shoulder is losing that range of motion. Not from the bench, but from neglecting other movements. Anyways, enough of that tangent, time to get back on track. Starting out pretty mainstream, dips are a great way to get into that full shoulder extension and then build up the strength to get out of it as well. And these could really be thrown in with that conventional strength work in the first part, but they're a little bit more specific, so I like to throw them in here. And a good movement to supplement dips with is some straight arm work that gets your shoulder into extreme extension. One of my favorite movements for this is the barbell rollback. It's really easy to set up. You just need to have a barbell and then put it behind you, sit on the ground, and roll back with it while holding onto it and trying to keep your arms pretty straight. This can feel pretty awkward at first, but you will get used to it over time. And a good way to kind of work up to it is to also add a stopper behind you when you first start. This will allow you to have that comfort to know that you won't go way past your capability at the moment, and you can more comfortably hang out right around your end range, which is gonna help you get more gains quicker. And this movement is just really great at getting your shoulder into that extreme extension, as well as having your bicep working at length, which really helps helps with your shoulder. An alternative to this would be something like using a cable machine to kind of do the same movement. That allows for a little bit more control over the range of motion as well as the loading scheme on it, or you can play around on some rings. I personally don't have a lot of experience with rings, so I can't talk on it too much. If you do, please leave some comments down below with some tips. And these other kind of more fringe smaller movements are similar to those smaller movements that I mentioned with typical rehab. They're just supplementary. They shouldn't be done as the bulk of your training and you shouldn't spend too much time on them. Sometimes you'll have a little bit more focus on increasing the range of motion in your shoulder and at those training times they can take up a little bit more, but they don't always need to be a massive part of your program. So what I like to do is just have a little bit more focus on these for when I'm trying to do things like increase my shoulder range of motion, but then once I have it, I'm just doing other movements through that full range a little bit more easily and I can load them up heavier. I still do these from time to time, but they're not a massive part of my training. And another thing to note is that even with mobility, you shouldn't expect quick changes. Changes take time. So whatever movement you're focusing on, make sure that you're patient with it. You put in the time needed. It's the same as loading an exercise. You need to kind of work within your capacity and then slowly progressively overload it. And now that I've gone over shoulder extension, I want to go over full flexion. And for that, I really like using single arm pullovers. So again, this is a smaller movement and I like doing this because I can really focus on the shoulder movement itself. I like doing them palm up, but they can also be done palm in and I do that from time to time as well. I find that palm up has a little bit more focus on like the subscap and pec muscle a little bit. And then palm in, I tend to feel a little bit more in my lat and teres major area. I use these when it's a little bit difficult to get into that full flexion range, or if you're having problems with things overhead like the Olympic lifts or behind the neck work, which I'm going to get to in a second. So these single arm pullovers are really great at allowing you to use smaller weights and kind of really ease into that range. Let your brain get comfortable with it, build up some strength in it, 
and then you can use it. So I always pair these with some behind the neck presses and pull-ups, which are the next movements in this kind of resilience framework. I personally found that doing the single arm pullovers really helped those behind the neck movements get a lot more comfortable within like one to two sessions. Then after that, I did the pullovers less and a lot more time just doing the behind the neck presses and the behind the neck pull-ups. So doing the pullovers helped me get comfortable there, but doing the behind the neck work actually helped me build up the range, strength, and resilience there. And moving on really similar to those pullovers is full range flies. This is something that I think is really important, but is kind of slept on. And I would say that these actually have a lot more benefit than the pullovers because they help you to actually build some bigger pecs as well and build up that shoulder range of motion. So I kind of classify those pullovers as one of those fringe supplementary exercises. Use them when you need to, just like internal and external rotation. But full range flies are kind of a staple in the program. Many people complain that big pecs limit shoulder range of motion, but again, that's just from a misunderstanding. So people with big pecs usually do a lot of bench press and they focus only on that and not working through that full range. Building muscle isn't going to limit your range of motion unless you're just absolutely blasting some special vitamins. Neglecting training through a full range of motion is what limits it. Trust me, you're not so jacked that your muscles are limiting your range of motion. Drop the ego, stop the cope, and just start working on training through a full range of motion so you can be big and mobile. It's possible. Now that's pretty much all that I do and have done for my shoulder, but I do know that there are other things that can be helpful. For example, Lucas from Range of Strength, as well as Atlas Power Shrug, do some barbell pullovers from time to time with a focus on the end range there. They're a little bit different than pull-ups because like I said, they focus on the end range, so that tension is a bit different and can really help you get comfortable in that full flexion. I personally haven't done them that often because they weren't a main focus in my training and I didn't really have much room for it. So when I did try them, it wasn't the most comfortable, so I didn't spend time on it. But now that I have a little bit more freedom, I might start throwing them in some more. So if you have any tips for me, please comment them down below so I can try them out. It is much appreciated, and I thank you in advance. And like I said earlier, internal and external rotation can still be trained. The problem is that it's just underloaded. And Alec Blennis has actually made some good points about this as well. Just load it up and train it heavy just like you would any other movement. Just like it's a bench press, just like it's an overhead press, it doesn't matter. You're just getting stronger. Again, I haven't used them very much, but if your training goals include needing to be strong in internal and external rotation, for example, if you're an arm wrestler or if your work or life demands you to be in internal or external rotation and have some strength there, throwing them into your program and actually loading it is going to be very helpful for you. Just don't be stupid with the progression and try to load it up as heavy as you can on day one. Start within your capacity and build it up over time. Most people would think we're done there, but there are a couple more muscles that I want to go over that I think are very important for shoulder health. They have been trained a little bit, but they haven't been trained directly. And I know it seems like I just keep tacking more and more onto this video and it's already getting quite long, but trust me, these are the last things I'm going to talk about. I promise. So the last muscles to work on are the biceps and triceps. They both play a role in the shoulder joint, so it can be very helpful to work on them. For the triceps, I find that working them overhead is the best, so I like to focus on things like the French press or any kind of overhead extension. And for the biceps, just doing a standard dumbbell or barbell curl is plenty, especially if you're already doing that straight arm work that I mentioned earlier, you're going to be getting some of that length and work. If you can work them at a lengthened position, that's more optimal, but it's not really necessary or needed. The thing that's going to be most helpful is just getting them strong and then exposing them to that range from time to time. And the way I like to think about those straight arm movements for the biceps is similar to doing stiff leg deadlifts or RDLs with the hamstrings, so they are really good. And I know this can seem like a lot, but as I said earlier, you don't have to always be doing all of this. Pick the movements that are most in line with your goals, have the main focus on them, and then just do the other movements from time to time. As long as you're doing them from time to time, you're still going to make some slow gains on them, and that's okay. You're also going to find that making gains in one movement is going to help out at least one other movement, and that's because of the redundancy that I spoke about earlier. So over time, you're going to be surprised with how much increase you get on all of the movements just by working some of them from time to time and how far you get with each one. This will also help you to see which movements have the most impact on you and which ones you find the most helpful. Sometimes you're going to do a movement and it's going to suck so bad that you just can't really do it and you're going to have to just keep that to the side for now and work on other things. Or you're going to do a movement and you're not going to love it and that means you don't really have to ever do it. But sometimes you'll do a movement and it'll feel great and you'll get amazing gains with it and it'll help everything else and that'll probably be a staple in your program. Explore a little bit, go in with an open mind, and just get strong and comfortable with them all. Thank you for watching, and if you have any questions or topics you want to hear my thoughts on, please comment them down below. Now go out there and make some gains.